great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And uh, as was noted, I have been associated with the Academy for over 20 years uh, and been friends of Kathy and Wayne for just as long. And I'm very appreciative of a program like this, and it shows the dedication they have to make our world a little better. And I'm pleased to share with you a few thoughts that I have this afternoon. Reading the poop sheet they gave me, they said that you guys are going to change the world. <laughs> oh my God, we're going to change the world. Isn't that precious? Well, let me tell you about it this way. Uh, there are lots of ways to change the world. Uh, I was at the University of Monterey in Mexico uh, about six weeks ago. And I was there to speak at the dedication of a new center at the university that was dedicated to the arts and the humanities. And it was from the endowment of a man by the name of Roberto Garza Sada, a great Mexican philanthropist. He had bought the ground that the university is on. He has sustained the university. His family opened a technical institute not far from the university in Monterey. And he did all these wonderful things. And he invested in the community. He was the best social entrepreneur that Monterey or that part of Mexico has ever had. And so when I was preparing my remarks to celebrate his life and also to dedicate this new facility, I got before the audience and his, his siblings were there, his uh, children were there and grandchildren were there. And I said he did all these wonderful things. But the most important thing Roberto Gazasada did was to create jobs for people. He was an industrialist. And he got involved in many, many things. But the most important thing he did, the greatest act of social entrepreneurship, was to create jobs for people. It was only through the creation of jobs and the creation of wealth from those jobs that he was able to become a philanthropist. It was only through making this kind of contribution to the business sector, sector through the creation of wealth that allowed him to do these wonderful things later in life. And when you think of the greatest entrepreneurs that we have, the greatest social entrepreneurs we have now, none of them started out saying, I'm going to be a social entrepreneur and change the world. Steve Jobs flunked out of school. Uh, Bill Gates didn't finish. Colin Powell, uh, I'm not considering myself in the category of these other gentlemen, but I get asked the question all the time, you know, uh, gee, when you were a young kid growing up in the South Bronx section of New York, did you realize that you were going to grow up to be the Secretary of State of the United States of America and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I just kind of smile and say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there I was. I believe I was about 10 years old. I was standing on the corner of 163rd and Kelly. And I said to myself, self, you're going to grow up and be Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> because life, life doesn't unfold that way. I love to tell student groups, not as distinguished a group as this, not only graduates, but high school and college level kids, that I graduated from the City College of New York with a 2.0 average. And they go, whoa, 2.0? I barely made it. And the reason was that I had straight A's in ROTC, which brought my average up to 2.0. <laughs> and after four and a half years, two majors, getting into sort of difficulties with the administration of the City College of New York, they said, get them out of here. Give them a BS in something. Geology, fine. Give it to them. Get them out of here. Let the Army have them. And now I'm considered one of the greatest sons the City College of New York has ever had. <laughs> they have named awards in my honor. I've gotten every award they have. I go to every fundraising dinner they hold. I have a center named after me, the Colin Powell Center for Policy at the City College of New York. And we do things a lot like Wayne and Kathy are doing. I have my own Powell fellows who are doing the kinds of things that you are doing. They're studying, they're learning, a different kind of group. It's 88% minority and 50% immigrant. Not that their families are immigrants, the kids themselves are immigrants, and they're older. They are working people. They have families. They have to work in order to stay in school. And what we're doing with them is kind of what you guys are doing. We want them to get their education. We want them to get a job or to create a business, to create wealth. 
so that that wealth can be used for social entrepreneurial purposes. But at the same time, as part of their education, just as you're doing here, we want them to learn about the problems of Harlem, where the school is located. We send them out to Chad and Senegal and other places, to Honduras and other places, to do studies that are related to their specialty in school. We now have every department of City College, every the history department, every department has now joined us and are working with our fellows in service learning and helping others. But we have to keep in mind that in order for a society to thrive, and in order to lift up people, which is what you all are thinking about, and you ought to be thinking about, the thing that will lift a person up out of poverty query with anything else is a job. My parents uh, came to this country uh, 90 years ago now, and uh, they just came for jobs. They didn't want to leave Jamaica. Nice down there, man. We got rum, we got ackee, we got all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> they couldn't get work. Why do most immigrants come to this country? For work or for an education that they can't get where they are or better life. And so my parents came here and they worked hard. Laborers in the garment industry uh, in the 37th Street section of New York City. My mother was a seamstress. She put the little tags that you have in your clothing. And every Friday night I would watch her as she would bundle up these hundreds of tags. That's how you get paid, piecework. And she would take them in on Monday and give them to her boss and she'd get paid the following Friday. My father, he thought he was in management just because he was a foreman. And they argued all the time. They're just a worker. I'm a foreman. A foreman, my, he's a shipping clerk. Give me a break. And they used to argue all the time. But it was great fun to watch them. But what I learned from that experience was that the dignity those two little immigrant people brought into my home on a Friday night with a paycheck made all the difference to the life that my sister and I had and what we were able to achieve in our lives. And so uh, social entrepreneurship really begins with trying not just to go out and be do-gooders. It's trying to create wealth in societies because through wealth you create jobs and jobs create wealth. And I mean wealth in the better sense of the word. I don't mean wealth for rich people. I mean wealth that brings schools into communities. I mean wealth that allows you to have a health care system. I mean wealth that gives you a social safety net underneath you. And so social entrepreneurship can't just be seen as doing good works, charity works or nonprofit works. It has to include building up the entire society, both economically and in terms of realizing that as you all become successful in life, and there's nobody in this room who's not going to be successful in life, some more than others. But as you gain that success, you have such an obligation to give back. The way that I've tried to do in this latter stage of my life and throughout my career, the way that uh, the gentleman I was speaking about, Roberto Garza Sada, knew that he got so much from Monterey and so much from this community in Mexico that what was he going to do with it all? Give it back. And now in the third generation, he's been dead for 30 years, in this third generation of his family, they continue to give back. So make that an essential part of your life, and it wouldn't be an essential part of your life, or it, you, know, you wouldn't be here if it was not going to be an essential part of your life. And it's needed more than ever. And as you try to, quote, save the world, I've tried it too, and I found that I could maybe save a little piece of it. I adopted a school in Washington uh, about 11 years ago. Uh, I found that America's promise to reach out and help people, uh, kids. And uh, I went to the superintendent of the schools here in Washington. I said, I'm asking everybody else to volunteer and do something. You know, you heard uh, one of our speakers just a moment ago saying, you know, uh, inspiration or planning without action is, is, is nonsense. You can't just have a vision. Vision without execution is nonsense. And so I'm telling everybody else what to do. Give me a school. Let me adopt a school. They gave me a middle school, all minority, Hispanic, and uh, black kids. About 400 of them in a middle school. It was a mess. I got Marines and soldiers from Fort Myer and Quantico Base to go paint it. It's good to be a general. Hey, come on. <laughs> I went to Home Depot and bought new light fixtures. I went and bought clocks, $10 digital clocks. The clocks had not worked in that school for 25 years. 
we fixed the nurses station. There was no nurses station, no little bed or no, no medicines or no little basic things that a nurse could use to take care of a kid. We fixed the cafeteria and we did everything we could to raise the physical standards of the facility and then we had to start getting with these kids one on one. And I discovered within a year or two that I couldn't save 500 kids. I had to focus on 40 kids. And for the last 12 years, that program we started then, married up with my church now, we are trying to save 40 kids a year. You can't save the whole world at once. It's a piece, a bit at a time, a kid at a time, a family at a time, a community at a time. And you try to spread out that work. So as you all move forward in life, and as you gain your doctorates and PhDs and MDs and JDs, whatever else you're studying, uh, and as you think big thoughts, just remember the creation of wealth is what's driving the world and more and more of it is needed. And remember that as you're trying to save the world, see if you can just save a couple of kids or save a community or save one family. That's the way it ultimately gets done. And if you can extend that experience, like the Harlem Children's Zone you may have heard about under Greg Canada, Jeff Canada, where he essentially started with a kid and realized I can't fix a kid without fixing the family. I can't fix the family without fixing the neighborhood. So I fixed one block and now he's fixed a hundred blocks in Harlem. And that's the way you have to go about it. As you become successful people, do something similar to what a good friend of mine, a member named Ron Simon did. He's got a family owned company it's in California and he has factories around the country. They make kitchen cabinets prefabricated, made up ahead of time. You can buy them at Home Depot, Lowe's. That's where he sells his products. And he became reasonably wealthy, and he wanted to start doing something for kids. So he started giving scholarships to kids to go to college. Yeah, see, I'm a great guy. I'm giving scholarships to kids. Isn't that wonderful? Then he discovered there wasn't enough. He had to start these kids off on the right foot when they were just entering high school. He couldn't wait until they were ready to go to college. He had to fix them earlier. And then after he did that, he realized that's not good enough. I've got to get them in elementary school. And I've got to get them in middle school. And so he has now made this the work of his life, not just making kitchen cabinets, but using his wealth, using his employees, using his family, partnering with our organization, America's Promise, to get into the lives of these kids as early as you can. Why do I keep focusing on wealth creation? The reason I do it is because I've seen a lot in my 50 plus years of public service. And I've seen it as a soldier, I've seen it as a national security advisor, I've seen it as Secretary of State, I've seen it in the business world and in the, uh, in the nonprofit world. I've been in all of these worlds. And the most powerful political force at work today is not what's going on in Afghanistan, it's not what's going on in Iraq, Iran. These are all important, troubling places. But what's really going on in the world is the connection of the world through the internet. And you heard Google talked about a minute ago. I'm an advisor to Google, so full disclosure. Uh, the Googleization of the world, the yahooing of the world, where the world is connected increasingly and breaking down all political, cultural, and language barriers even, the geograph geographic barriers, time barriers that used to exist, and the world's connected. And as I look at the world that's so different than the world I started out in, I started out in a world of a Soviet empire, a Chinese empire, those, those curtains are gone, those iron curtains are gone. And instead you have Eastern Europeans who are doing what? They want BMWs. They want an improving economy. What's going on in China? Hundreds of millions of people have moved into the middle class. The streets are jammed. I was there three weeks ago, I couldn't believe it. The streets are jammed. What are they doing? They're creating wealth. And why are the Chinese so, cons so consumed with this? Because they got 800 million people who have not seen anything yet. And 300 million, 400 million who are doing very well. And so everybody's trying to create wealth. What's Brazil doing? Political stability so we can have economic stability. And economic stability allows us to create wealth. And if we create wealth, they'll reelect us. That's the beauty of political democracy. You get reelected if you fix the economic system. And so it's this creation of wealth and the bringing people up into the middle class that will start to stabilize societies and nations. So a lot of what I do has to do with how do we give people clean water? How do we provide them electricity? Can't we wipe out malaria by giving out nets? It looks like between nets and other programs, that's possible. 
But all of that is to no avail unless you have an economic system that is creating wealth. That then leads to energy. You need energy to create wealth because that's how economies grow, through energy. And energy and economic growth together produce environmental problems. We throw a lot more stuff into the sky. And those three things come together. Energy, economics, the environment, and then the final one, which has become the passion of my life and the passion of my wife's life, is the education of our youngsters. A third of our kids don't finish high school. 50% of our minority kids don't finish high school. In a country like ours, where services and technology become more important than making t-shirts, um, which has gone to other countries, we cannot afford this loss of human talent, particularly in the minority communities, because the minority communities in one generation are going to be the majority population in this country. Gaza Sada did was to create jobs for people. He was an industrialist, and he got involved in many, many things. But the most important thing he did, the greatest act of social entrepreneurship, was to create jobs for people. It was only through the creation of jobs and the creation of wealth from those jobs that he was able to become a philanthropist. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And uh, as was noted, I have been associated with the Academy for over 20 years uh, and been friends of Kathy and Wayne for just as long, and I'm very appreciative of a program like this, and it shows the dedication they have to make our world a little better. And I'm pleased to share with you from the university in Monterey. And he did all these wonderful things, and he invested in the community. He was the best social entrepreneur that Monterey or that part of Mexico has ever had. And so when I was preparing my remarks to celebrate his life, and also to dedicate this new facility. I got before the audience and his, his siblings were there, his uh, children were there and grandchildren were there. And I said he did all these wonderful things, but the most important thing, Roberto Monterey in Mexico uh, about six weeks ago. And I was there to speak at the dedication of a new center at the university that was dedicated to the arts and the humanities. And it was from the endowment of a man by the name of Roberto Garza Sada, a great Mexican philanthropist. He had bought the ground that the university is on. He has sustained the university. His family opened a technical institute not far. A few thoughts that I have this afternoon. Reading the poop sheet they gave me, they said that you guys are going to change the world. <laughs> Oh, my God. We're going to change the world. Isn't that precious? Well, let me tell you about it this way. Uh, there are lots of ways to change the world. Uh, I was at the University of Monterey.